We are recording. Lizzie, do not answer that question in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Who would win in a fight, Brian or Pete Davidson? No one. <laughs> Nobody wins. Are you sure? Uh, welcome to the Emo Social Club podcast, broadcasting to you live from EmoSocialClub.tv. I am Brian. And I'm Lizzie, and we're here this evening with our new friend. Well, been around friend, Oslo, better known as <laughs> TJ. Thank you so much for hanging out with us this evening. Hey guys, thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm very happy to be here. We've been friends for a while. We're not new friends. We we're, yeah. we're on the Chicago area. It's a very tight knit scene. Uh, but why don't you uh, tell us about this project you're doing, Oslo, and tell us about yourself? And yeah, just give us a little give us a little rundown. Let's just let's just learn about TJ. Get through it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, yeah. Definitely. I love talking about myself. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, the project uh, kind of started a few years ago, even before the pandemic. It's just kind of um, an idea, a concept. I had these songs that I was writing and that didn't really fit with like uh, my previous band. And um, it was just kind of like a, a side of music that I really like and, and influenced by that I wanted to explore. So I kind of started writing some of these songs the genesis was like you know five or six years ago um always kind of with like the intention of wanting to do a solo something um and then the pandemic hit and i kind of just saw it as an opportunity to uh learn more about the like production engineering side of music which i've always been interested in but i never really had any time to sit down and learn um just on tour all the time for a few years. So <clears throat> yeah, when the pandemic hit, I just sort of dove in and um, I started teaching myself the like more technical side so that I could get to a point where I could record my own music and have it sound good and competitive and whatever. Um, and at the same time, started writing more for with a solo album in mind. Um, so the album kind of it tells a story of that year 2020 and how, just how crazy everything was um and then i kind of finished writing and recording it like uh you know maybe like almost a year ago but i just felt like i wasn't at the uh point where i could mix it to how i wanted it to sound so um, I kind of just took my time with it and I've just started, you know, practicing and learning more and, um, finally got to a point where I was happy with everything. So, um, yeah, that's, that's sort of the gist. Now's just the time it's post pandemic. Mm -hmm. It's like it's time. Let's put it out. Let's make it happen. Mm -hmm. Would you ever consider like touring on it? Cause I know this is obviously like a new side project, but especially now that we're kind of up, out in the open, would that be something you would ever consider? I would be open to it, but it was definitely written, like not with a live show in mind. Um, even like there's different tunings in all the songs and, you know, some of it is more like full band. Some of it is really stripped down. So I'm not exactly sure what that would look like, but at least to, to play a show or a couple of shows, I think would be, pretty fun i would just have to figure out how to make that work <laughs> find more people to play behind you and yeah I, I, it's interesting to go from being in a band for so long and then like i've always been curious when bands in the back in the day like said oh we're gonna have this band but like i want to do my solo project and they like start doing like uh like their own thing outside of it and it's like but this is basically like the same thing but obviously you're 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 doing something different and it's something that's like you're expressing for yourself uh like what is the main thing that you feel like is different between like playing in a band playing with other people and writing for yourself and writing your own project um i don't really like singing or maybe i just don't like how my <laughs> voice sounds um so that was like a weird thing and even like, you know, with Sleep On It, I, I sang back up and stuff. But um, yeah, to be sort of at the forefront, never considered myself a singer, but I felt like I had a, 
these things that I wanted to say and these songs that I felt like only, you know, that I would be able to express. So um, that was like a, it was a weird thing. And it was, it was very much just me from start to finish, but I, I wanted to challenge myself that way. So it was, a, it was kind of isolating, but I think that's like really the vibe of the record and what it's about. So I feel like it kind of captured that. Um, yeah, it's, I think I just wanted something to, um, I wanted that sort of therapy, I guess, that sort of like catharsis um, to be like, yeah, I did this, you know, uh, whatever happens with it is, is cool. But it was like, I had to prove something to myself. Just the fact that you were able to sit down and like put things together and be like, hey, this works. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've been writing songs for a long time, but um, to, first of all, just not have anybody else, um, but also to be the one like recording it and like mixing it and approaching it from like a analytical, like technical side. Um, it was, it was definitely a different experience, but it was cool. And with this, because, um, your main single off of this Loma Prita, if we're all saying that, right, we were all talking about this beforehand. So we made sure we didn't screw it up, but it's no, we're saying it right. Okay. How okay. do we say it? Is um, <laughs> but it, it's about you feeling like a disaster and it's obviously like a much heavier album. And like you said, it's like a catharsis. Can you tell us like what went into producing one, the single, and then some of these other, um, tracks that are on this album? For sure. I think when I started writing, uh, it was uh, just just like me and an acoustic guitar. So a lot of like the really stripped down stuff was like what I was writing first. And as it went on, I started doing more like full band production. So Loma Prita was like one of the last songs that I did. Um, so to, to do like a, a song with like drums and bass and like a whole production was a bit more involved, but I really loved doing that. Um, and as far as like that song, uh, it kind of just started with like a little voice memo, just like humming the, the melody for the chorus. And sometimes it, you just get like that one line or that one lyric and it sort of just guides the ship of what the song is going to be about. And I had like uh, that, I'm a hurricane, that, like, just that line. And I, it was like, the vision for the whole song was just there with just that like one line and that one melody. Um, what I wanted it to be about the vibe sometimes all it takes is just kind of getting that one little like nugget of an idea. An idea nugget, if you will. <laughs> um, this is on the new, your LP, your album, which just came out. So if you're, if you're here listening to this right now, it's out. So you can go listen to it. Uh, great places. So, you know, let's just plug it. Let's just make sure everybody goes and listens to it. Thousand streams on each song today. Hmm. Go straight from this podcast to just running it up. Or do the double listening thing that I do and just put in the background while you're listening. No, that's to this. madness. That's madness. <laughs> like Lizzie will have like audio playing while editing audio. I'm like, how, first of all, how, how, how I've did you bring myself when you work in a newsroom and you just have people yelling at you, you have audio coming in and then you have to watch the news also to make sure it's all good. You learn. That's impressive though. For real. Like mm -hmm. I, when I'm like mixing here, if my fan is on, I can't focus. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, yeah, you do kind of have to like train yourself a little bit. So I'm impressed. Yeah, it's definitely like you have to train your ear. Like it's like same thing with like editing, like uh, just at, like audio in general. I get sent in like shows to edit and a lot of my coworkers will listen without um, their headphones plugged in anymore because they've trained themselves to be able to hear like echoes without it just like being through, which is wild to me. I am not there yet, but they know how to like edit it without being plugged in. It's just like out on their speakers. Wild. This is it, see. This is where because I'm 104 years old, I go. <laughs> well, these kids today, they go. Oh, it's got to be watching something or the YouTubes and the 
the musics and all their Spotify has got to be on all at the same time. You can't just, you know, enjoy the one thing. And I'm like, well, I do get it for like creating, you know, working and making something that has audio and sound. But I'm also like, yeah, isn't there just a little bit of like that, that ADHD brain where you're just like, I need to focus on like four things to get anything done. Yeah, it can be overstimulation for sure. And I think they say like the brain can only focus on a couple of things at a time. Um, but uh, I don't know, maybe just because I'm a millennial, but I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like don't. Yeah, I don't like the distractions and I'm guilty of it. Of Like even when I'm working, being on my phone, you know, and it's like mm-hmm. I need to like consciously like put my phone away or consciously like turn shit off and just not be distracted um especially when it's like time to write or or whatever it's this weird balancing act of like i want to be doing the thing that i love but what if i get a really important email or what if a friend texts me or what if like all of a sudden i'm blowing up on twitter or something like that it's like there's all these different parts of it where it's like But what if I what if that happens? I can't just like turn off my phone. I can't just like leave it in the other room because something will happen. But at the same time, it's like you can't even just focus on like the thing that you want to do. (laughs) Yeah, it's like a type of FOMO in a way. It's like I'm going to miss I'm going to miss something. And I feel like um, at least for me, I've gotten to a point where it's like programmed with the notifications on my phone where it's like some kind of fucking serotonin hit you know when when something lights up so it's like it really is kind of like an addiction and i go through like periods while where i'll just like delete stuff off my phone just to like not be so attached to it and try to live more in the moment um and just trying to be present it's kind of actually ties in a little bit to what the album is about just trying to be present in the moment and it's it's hard especially nowadays and especially as like a creative or a musician or somebody who hosts a podcast like a lot of like what you do is really tied to your audience and connecting and having to like be um out in the social media world um and it can be really exhausting at at least for me like i don't know I'm finding ways to balance that a little bit better. It's like trying to shit post on Twitter, but then also like be serious and then also be on Instagram <laughs> and then trying to get on TikTok and make like a bunch of videos to see if any of them hit. And then you're like, why is it nothing hitting? I'm mm-hmm. having a terrible time. <laughs> yeah. And then it, it fucks with your psyche. And then it's like just this like constant feeling the need to like create content or else you'll become irrelevant. Um, it sucks because it's like, I don't know. It's not really, at least the way that my brain was designed. Like, I don't know. It's it just, it's kind of the, the world that we live in right now for creatives, um, having to be on all the time. But I feel like there's a way to be successful without like burning yourself out and burning your brain out. And I think something that I've come to realize is like um, exhaustion and fatigue. It's not just like a physical thing. Like your brain is a battery and it has a battery life. There's only so much brain juice (laughs) that you can possibly have in a day or a week or a month. And like I've fucking burnt myself out super bad and it sucks. And it's like, you know, I'm trying to figure out ways to like, get better about that but it's it's especially hard for um people who are more into like creative endeavors yeah i do think there's like a person type that like the social media side is the thing that they like creating like obviously there are people who like creating tiktoks there are people who like tweeting there are people who like make uh, uh you know, doing photos and then posting them on Instagram. And like that just becomes something that 
you are creating as your creation. But like for me, I've never really, I, I, I've never really been like a photo person. So like the idea that I have to like post photos all the time and just to like get like attention on the internet is like, that doesn't really make sense to me and doesn't, it's not something that I want to do. It doesn't make me feel good to go through the process of doing it, but I know that it's so that I can do other stuff. And that, that sort of battle between like, I don't like doing it, but I like the results of it is like the worst. Totally. Yeah. And that trend has been kind of going for quite a while, but I feel like it's even more apparent now. And, uh, just, just that feeling of like, I have to do this, but there is like results from it. And I, and, and that's how these like social media, uh, platforms are set up, right. It's like the more you post, the more you interact, the more people see your shit. So it's like, you have to keep doing it. Um, it's, it's a balance for sure. And that's not to say like, you know, it's enjoyable to like make some funny videos from time to time, but like, it, I think it could be easy to lose sight of what you're act, what you actually want to do, and get more caught up in likes and the shares or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think the solo project kind of goes in that way where it's like, am I creating for other people or am I creating for myself? And what am I, po am I posting for other people or am I posting for myself? And like, if you're happy with what you're creating, then it's not really that you're posting for other people. You're just posting because you're like, yeah, I want to put this out there in the world. Like when you're creating a solo project and you're like, Hey, I need people to hear it. Obviously I need that feedback of people hearing the music I made. And it's never like something that's only going to sit on your hard drive and never go anywhere. It has to be heard by people. So it's like, is that for you? Is it for the people you're, you're playing it for? Is it for your audience or, or yeah, it's always that like balance of like, who is this creation for? And with social media, it's like, man, it just really feels like it's for other people. But I really just want most of the stuff to be for like myself and my own satisfaction. You know, it's like I still want people to like listen to the, the music that I'm making. So I, I understand like it's a great way to connect and, and create awareness or make fans or whatever. Um, but I think for me, like with this project, part of the reason that I wanted to do it myself is like, you know, it, the whole thing was absolutely for myself. Like there's no, uh, trying to make something sound a certain way or whatever to, to, to grow a certain kind of audience. It was literally just like, this is, these songs are exactly what I'm fucking going through and the vibe and the feeling of it. And just not overthinking that. And, um, just being okay with like what it is and putting out into the world and, um, creating like, I don't know, I want people to hear it, but I, I want it to be genuine. And, um, I think like keeping, you know, realistic expectation, you know, it's all, it was also something that I wanted to uh, I want to keep working with other artists and producing and co-writing and mixing. So it, to me, it's just all kind of like a part of like a bigger thing that I'm trying to create. And do you have anybody in like mind you would want to collaborate more on more music coming out or if any other projects? Cause I know you mentioned that you were doing a lot of other things as well, aside from just your solo work. Sure. I mean, yeah, I, I, um, I, I, like pretty much all styles of music and I like working with people that that love what they're doing and get excited about it um you know I've worked with a couple of like great ch local Chicago bands I worked with this band called Long Gone recently our her, Trevor Hancock is a part of they're great um in the yeah. chat <laughs> shout out um love to keep working with like more local artists a lot of artists that I work with are like all over like international uh, there's like some kids from germany that i work with mm. kids from all over um i'm and then i also people have, have approached me about writing songs for them so a friend of mine is getting married and asked me to write a country song for his wedding and i've 
Interesting. Never written a fucking country song in my life, but I understand like what composes a country song or what goes into it or what makes um, people you know enjoy that. So that's been that's been cool and that's been kind of like a cool challenge um, that uh, that I, I want to keep doing. I was about to say a country song, a country wedding song. I feel like that is one of the <laughs> biggest challenges. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean. He had like the lyrics and everything, so it was just creating like the the music, and he, you know, gave me some like references and stuff. And it's a, uh, you know, I always try to uh, be of the mindset of uh, keep it simple, you know, don't o- don't overthink it, and just kind of catch a vibe, whatever whatever it is or whatever. They're like, <laughs> I know that there's like been a lot of artists that are just like, yeah, just send me a thing and I'll write a song for you, and like they just, you know. Um, I think that was something that uh, uh, say anything guy Max Bemis. Max, there Max we Max go. Is. Yeah, like he was doing it for a while of just like, hey, send me you know your ideas and I'll write a song for you. And it was like minute long or something like that. But it's like the idea that you would just be like, hey, I'm gonna reach out to somebody to just write a song for me for this thing has always been just such a foreign idea. Like, there's a, there's just, a whole there's a platform called. Um, uh downright mm. where That's mark rose right yeah yeah exactly Shout out mark rose and uh the guy from braid but anyway it's a platform that you can go on and find different like songwriters and there's there's actually a ton of songwriters that are in well-known bands and whatever and um you can hire them to write a song and a lot of times the when i've been approached it's like it's like a gift uh, to somebody, like a wedding um, or a, a birthday or like Christmas or something. Um, so it's kind of cool. It's like a unconventional, like I guess, sort of like gift. You know, I don't think I, n- nobody that I've that I've really just written a song flat out for is like uh, trying to like make it a career or anything. It's more just kind of like this like thing that they want to do for somebody hmm. i feel like that's a gift that you give to somebody that you're like you have everything and now here's this <laughs> yeah your own song. song yeah <laughs> yeah All these musicians. it was either this or more socks and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like listen which one's kind of cooler <laughs> yeah the socks i love socks i'm i'm old lizzie like good pair of socks you know I'm good. I'm I mean, set. I will say I like I like going to stance when I'm in um, Disney World and downtown Disney and getting the Disney theme socks. So I get it. <laughs> I'll be there next week. I can grab See, you go there. Yeah. It's, it's called Disney. St- go to stance. They have I got Coco's version socks and I love them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll pick you up some socks from Disney World. <laughs> uh what do you think about like if an artist did approach you and say like my mind goes to like little Nas X who basically just like bought a beat off the internet and made old town road and then it like blows up. And then the guy who makes the beat is like, um, but, and then be like, well, you technically used a, a nine inch nail sample. So it's not really like even your song in the first place. So like, how do you feel if, like, somebody was, like, yeah, I just want somebody to write a bunch of music for me. I'll buy it. And then, like, what happens if that blows up and everybody loves it? And it's, like, but I made that. That's me. Yeah, I mean, it's the way things are going, um, for sure. Like, a lot of artists that I've been, like, working with and mixing, they're they're essentially just, like, I guess purchasing you know, tracks or like the stems of a song or whatever, and then just singing over it. And then like, that's their song. And I get a ton of people who are doing that. Um, if that was like one of my songs that I wrote and it like blow up and it blew up. I mean, if you're selling it, I, I guess it really just depends on the situation. If there's royalties involved, that's great. If you're just selling like a beat or something, I mean, that's, that's what you signed up for. Like if you're going to sell something and put it out and it blows up, then you kind of have to like, I don't know, be okay with that. Um, but it's, you know, I don't know. 
people have been sampling for a long time. Um, it's not anything super new, but now especially with like uh, just more home studios, uh, people at home recording and can get it to sound decent. Um, yeah, it's really common. I get a lot of tracks where I, they'll just send me like a pre a bot like that a track that they bought and just sang over just like mix together it does feel like um i mean it's like the commodification of everything but i know in most cases like especially in rock music you're like the person who makes it and the authenticity behind the creation of it is so important to like what it is and how the audience connects with it. Like you're writing a song, you put everything together and that is communicated through the song to the person who hears it and they can connect with it. They can feel that. And they feel very disconnected from something that's like pop music where it's like, well, you just sang over this. You didn't even write the words. You didn't write anything like you're just a performer and not really feeling it. And I do feel like that's kind of stopped over time, but the like authenticity side and like rock music has always been, I don't know, this like this like one thing that's like holding it from like being just like a, a person who's just a performer playing rock music. I mean, that's kind of where it's going though. Um, like the, a lot of these tracks I'm getting, they're like rock or pop punk tracks where it's, um, I mean, I, I, mean, I feel like we all kind of grew up at a time where it's like the way that you like made and wrote music was like, got in a garage or a basement with your friends like that's what you had to do there wasn't like the option of um there was i I guess there was like drum samples and shit but it's not like it is today where it it can sound as good uh if not better than like actually going and like recording drums so now you have the option of some kid with his laptop just sitting at home and can make like a really cool sounding rock track you don't need like a whole band anymore where they could either just do everything, which is kind of like kind of what I did for this album. Um, or you can, you can make instrumentals and sell those and somebody buys it and sings over it. And like, that's their song. It's kind of, it is kind of like a weird, you know, new world, but it's becoming more and more common. Um, and of course there's, there's still bands like they're recording live in a studio or whatever, but, it's becoming process is becoming more accessible and a bit like democratized, I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think a lot of people during the pandemic kind of went through a similar thing that I did where it was like stuck at home. I want to learn this like skill. Um, and I think people, people just had like the time and the ability to, learn more about production to where you can make a really great sounding album if you know what you're doing in your bedroom and even if it's not a great the greatest sounding album people will still vibe with it and be like this is the greatest sounding album i have ever heard (laughs) yeah (laughs) which is also cool to see (laughs) yeah totally totally and of course it's like super subjective or whatever like um if you can, if you have the knowledge, you can create something and catch a vibe that's like, uh, that just sounds cool. I, I was just reading about a song, Mr. Brightside, uh, when the Killers did that. The what ended up being the final mix was like a really rough, quick, like mix, and they tried to like remix it three or four times to make it sound better. And every time they were just like, we just don't like it as much, you know. Hmm. Uh, so some, sometimes it doesn't have to be the most amazing sounding thing, but if you can get something that is, that again, just sort of captures a vibe of whatever you're trying to create, um, and that's become easier and more accessible, I think, this sort of exploded post-pandemic. Um, I have this theory that I'm working on, we're going to workshop it here. We're going to get into it. We're going to make it a, a legitimate theory. Brian's okay. been on his theory train today. <laughs> My brain is just working. It's just working over time. It's like train is trying to 
I'm putting a lot of coal in the engine and it's going the same speed. Uh, so I'm working on this theory and it, it is kind of related to like everybody now can, can more or less produce at home. And I've been acknowledging like how that is changing music, both from like the fact that a lot of songs are like a minute to two minutes long, which I am a huge fan of. I love short songs, like just get in, get out, write a good chorus and just get out of here. Uh, but also oh, like us get to the chorus, get to the chorus. Oh Don't God, need a fucking bridge. Down <laughs> no fucking bridges. We're yeah. done with bridges. Bridges. I'm gone. never crossing a river again. Blow I stay up. on this side of the yeah, blow that bridge up, baby. Don't bore yeah. us. Get to the chorus. <laughs> Every time I've been to a show without Brian, I'll like text him and be like, yo, half this half of their set is like two minute songs. And he's like, I should have been there for uh, those two minute songs. Yeah, like, dude. I guess. <laughs> dude, I'm getting to bed early tonight. That's a good that's a good night. Uh, I heard the entire discography. I'm set. I'm saying <laughs> if you can get, if you can play your entire discography in an hour and a half, I'm having a great time. I'm having a beautiful night. And I'm in bed early. That's 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 all I want in this time of my life. Uh, but the fact that like it is democratized will obviously change the way that art is made and the way that art then sounds right. Like somebody who is very confident and doesn't have the knowledge or talent, but puts their thing out and people gravitate towards it. They love it. They like the the person who made it. They like the authenticity behind it. Now that thing becomes popular, and now everyone's going to try to replicate it. And I'm, like, curious on how, because everybody is now just copying the quote-unquote bad thing or the quote-unquote not professional thing, how is that changing the way that we are perceiving, like, new music that's coming out that's, like, like, like I think of hyper pop is like all pretty much self-produced and it's like, this is some crazy nonsense. That is awesome. hundred X is so good, but it's weird as shit. And now are people going to say, I want to do what a hundred Gex did for my hip hop act or for my uh, pop punk band. <laughs> I'm going to have a hyper pop <laughs> punk band. It's like, how are we like going to see music change now that everybody can make anything sound good you don't need a band to play the drums like you said and it's like we can just make all this stuff like what does that mean for future music and to me i just think it's gonna get fucking weird yeah it, it leaves a lot of room for experimentation for sure um but i also think it's like from an artist perspective figuring out how to um like rise above the noise like if there's just more music and content being released then how do you like um, differentiate yourself from everything else that's coming out? Just high pitch vocals. <laughs> oh no. Just gecking, gecking up. You, you just end up trying to like make your own genres to stand out and it'll be like the silliest thing. I mean, that's how we get butt rock and everything. So, <sighs> okay, well we need butt rock, you know, we do need butt rock, but besides that, you are not never butt hurt nobody. Oh my god! <laughs> Put that but on a T-shirt. Yeah. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> Sell it and then just do like this yeah. crazy like art and just be like guys selling it. It's like metal, new metal logo, yep. but it's yep. like something like insane, yep. like a little bit of butcher. Never hurt nobody. <laughs> crazy selling. bitch printed on the back. <laughs> Dude, I'm selling that. I'm selling that down south. Take that to Florida. Sell it. Sell it for some socks. Get bust. <laughs> Get bust. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> it is like it is like genre is is where I think a lot of people are playing around and just like experimenting with combinations and putting things together that that, you know, before didn't make any sense, like peanut butter and chocolate. It's like now all of a sudden it's it's everywhere. And I don't know, I, I, there is part of me that's like, OK, we can stop inventing genres. We can just write good songs, no bridges. But there's also unless like, you're Fall Out Boy, because Fall Out Boy writes the best bridges. Look, they Every, write good bridges. I'd be fine if, else, if everyone else can stop fucking writing bridges. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Fall, yeah. Fall, Leave all the bridges to Fall Out Boy. Boy. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a fair compromise. Yeah, yeah. Pre hiatus, Fall Out Boy can continue writing bridges. Yes, yeah. That wow. little asterisk. Yes. Slander. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a band that no longer writes that way. 
You got to go back to it. If you want to write a bridge, you got to write us, uh, you know, take this to your grave too. Part two. Which many, 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 many bands have tried. Did anybody see, I forgot who did it, but it was some music mag online and they ranked Mania as Fall Out Boy's best album. And listen, I love Mania unapologetically, but it is not their best album. And I was very confused by the reasoning. Uh, I have, I don't even... I can't even respond. To I think that. it just broke everyone's brain. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah dude. That, 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 that did just melt my brain a little bit. I, I like, literally yeah, read it and melted my right? brain, and I was like, "Hmm." That's like shit posting on Twitter. They said Folia Do was like the second to the last that's of the incorrect. best albums. I said that is incorrect. Wrong. That is a hundo p incorrect. So wrong. That's objectively think, wrong. That's not even yeah. opinion. That's just objectively yeah. wrong. Yeah. It is like <laughs> objective fact outside of musical opinion. It's objectively mm-hmm. better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it is. This it's is very is very upsetting. <laughs> this person yeah. just wanted clicks for their bad take. That's 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 how I feel about it. I don't know anything about it. That's what it is. I'm gonna have to find it uh, and send it to everybody, and then we'll have to start and then burn um, the magazine down. But the, a lot of these those <laughs> fucking listicles, it really is just like clicks for bad takes. It's mm-hmm. like there's no way that person actually believes that in their heart of hearts that Mania is Fall Out Boy's best album, like. But everyone's probably like, what the fuck? And then they click the link and, Mm -hmm. you know, mission accomplished. (sighs) Clickbait central. Phony. Phony. Oh, man, we're getting catcher in the Ryan here. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) Like, there's no way we we did a tier ranking of all their records, which was very uh, difficult for me because I don't care for anything post hiatus. And you haven't even you didn't even listen to most of them. That's correct. So I am, again, objectively correct. And I we, we agree that Take This to Your Grave is their top record, their best record. They started off the gate just so good. I mean, I disagree, but we can right. still be friends. We can still well, be. <laughs> good. Listen, uh, as long as nobody... Again, as a mania stand, as no as nobody's ranking mania as the number one follow boy album overall. <laughs> yeah, we can all we can all find some common ground here and just yeah. say fuck that person. <laughs> yeah. I have gotten uh, I've gotten Zach's opinion and I've gotten Jake's opinion, so I guess I'll get the third sleep on it member's opinion of what is the best Fall Out Boy record. Me, Jake, and Zach all share pretty similar opinions, and Foley Do is actually one that I never spent any time with until like touring with those guys and that really like upped on my list after that but um it's cork tree is still my my number one which i think is also a problem i think it's theirs too they i think when we talked about it this was a few years ago but i think when we talked about it they said it was foley and they we got in an argument because i said it was infinity on high and I still stand by that, but Foley is. Wait, is you up think there. Infinity on High is their best album? Yes, that's a take. Oh, I, th- I thought you just said uh, take this to your grave. It's my great. it's my top album. Yeah, I think that we would all agree that collectively, yeah, collectively, take this to your grave is like their strongest record. But I do think that like the artistic backing and everything that goes into Infinity on High is just better than like. From top to bottom, I think Infinity on High has better songs. I think it is a stronger record. And I think Take This to Your Grave is just a lot of like pop punk hits, which is great. And it's strong. Uh, for me, I think Infinity on High has more hits than skips. And, and you know, we're going to stay friends after this. You already said it, so you can't take it back now. No uh, I think I think Cork Tree just has a few more skips than than the other ones. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I would probably put Cork Tree first, uh, Foley second. Uh, yeah, take this to your grave third, and fit. And then there's, and then there's post hiatus. The other ones. Yeah. Say rock and roll slaps. I don't know what anybody's talking about. <laughs> there's some good songs. I don't know. I mm-hmm. just. They also like those albums just came out later, so I wasn't like, you know. 16 listening to it uh <laughs> which yeah. Uh, yeah 
That's the thing. It's like if you're 16 listening to it, that's going to be your favorite. And I I didn't get into Fall Out Boy until Infinity on High. So I think that's probably also why I stand that way. But even like listening back and like trying to be objective. Still where I land. Fall the Gin Joints is my favorite Fall Out Boy. Of all the gin joints is a phenomenally good song. It's so fucking good. Yeah. And it's like they I've never I've seen them a few times, never seen them play it like kind of like deep cut. I, <laughs> I like I like telling people, because this happened when I saw them at Wind Tour. I said play Chicago so two years ago, you cowards, and they did. So yeah. if you call them cowards, they might do it. Yeah. I see. Everyone gets scared. And they're like, ah, oh, oh no. It's like it's like the equivalent, like the modern day equivalent to like calling someone chicken, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh it's like cowards, like you have to play it. <laughs> yeah. It's like you and them are sharing two cars and you gotta whoever the first one is to like pull away before you hit each other. I thought it was driving off like a cliff and like the extreme situation of like That's more chicken with like yourself. But like you would play chicken of like the two cars are going to hit each other and the first person to like peel off to not get hit. That's the person who loses. Unless you hit each other, in this case, everyone loses. <laughs> but no one's scared. And then you hear Chicago. So two years ago. All right, guys, so we're not going to do to uh, drive cars <laughs> into each other. <laughs> we do not endorse the driving of cars into each other. Yeah, absolutely. Do not do that. Or off a cliff. Like that that's also a big hell nah, brother. <laughs> Oslo and Emo Social Club do not endorse driving your car to hit each other. That is not what we stand we for. We endorse Bye listening fall boy. to every Bye follow fall boy, boy album. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, son of a bitch. Uh <laughs> so you okay. um with your music at least, y- you've also Back to your music. <laughs> transitioned a little bit. So you went from pop punk to more indie. So how was that like process? for navigating away from it. I know we've seen a lot of artists do that, especially recently. We've seen like Ann Arbor come back and they're more like indie pop. We've seen Emma Rosa come back and they're literally like an eighties band now. It's very weird, Respect. but they did it. Um, but we see this transition happening. So what was kind of like in your mindset when going from one to the other? Um, it was fun, honestly. Um, just like I love writing pop punk but i also just have this a different side of like other stuff that i listen to and i'm inspired by so it was fun to like explore that a little um i you know i i think like i'll i still love writing like pop punk and rock and stuff and we'll continue to do that for sure but I, it was just fun to explore another type of sound and um just experiment a little bit um i think like bands that change their sound as long as it's something that they really like believe in and get excited about um like i don't know like the amorosa stuff I, their newer stuff i think is great i love it like if you really believe in what you're doing um and you're you're not doing it for like any external reasons um i think it's great if it's like a trend and it's like forced or something um that, that kind of like it, it kind of comes through like you can tell that when people are like doing something because they think that they should or sounding a certain way but yeah it was it was it's been fun to try some different stuff different tunings play some different chords besides Not just the same four Besides drop D, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, how I learned how to play guitar was like, oh, it's all in drop D. I'm going to have a great time. Hey, man, I still love playing in drop D. It's like, I don't know. I like different styles. And sometimes the mood strikes, you know, try something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think a lot of it is like performance too. Like if you're like, if you're playing punk rock chords, you can like sort of run around and jam out a little bit more because you don't have to worry so much about like what your left hand is doing. This is I'm I'm being very right hand centric here, so you know, <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, but yeah, if you're like playing a simple chord, it's easier to like run around and do 
like dumb things on stage. But if you're like, I got to hit all these notes and I got to shred or, or I got to like play like more like jangly guitar stuff. You're like, yeah, you can't really do the same stage antics. Especially when you crank the distortion, you can fuck up and it's like not that noticeable. But dude, when I was recording some of these like acoustic songs, it's like finger picking. And I'm like halfway through, I'm like, why the fuck did I write this? <laughs> acoustic <laughs> finger picking part where it's like one little mistake is like so obvious. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially when it's like really stripped down like that. Yeah, it was, it was a lot different than like just layering fat electric guitar, you know, rhythms on top of each. <laughs> it's cool. You only have yourself to blame. I really do. Yeah, you're literally probably sitting there like, who did this? Oh, me. <laughs> oh, me. I did all of this. And I'm the only one here. And I'm just <laughs> going over the same acoustic <laughs> finger picking part like a hundred times. The, yeah. Good times. Good. So what we're understanding is that the worst part about doing a solo project is that you only have yourself to blame. By Fall Out Boy. By Fall Out Boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is a meme that I will never get tired of. Because That's gonna be uh, actually the the podcast title is gonna be something extraordinarily long by Fall Out Boy. <sighs> Perfect. Featuring Oslo. <laughs> that was that was kind of originally like our our idea for the pod is like we should just do emo like long titles for the for every episode of the podcast and I'm like I don't think that's gonna play. <laughs> <laughs> I would appreciate it, it's but work. yeah, I get. It. Yeah, it's like that inside baseball like. Mm, Maybe that's only for like four people and we want at least seven people to hear this podcast. You could throw out like one episode that has that a title like that. Yeah. As a treat. As it a might treat. be yeah. this, it might as, be as this little, one. Little it might cupcake. be this one. Yeah. Yeah. Like it. I would be honored to be that, that one. Yeah. A little treat for everyone. Else. How many words are appropriate? Like twelve? Fifteen. I, mean, tw- I think twelve is kind of a lot. It depends on what kind of words, how long they are. But twelve is like a—that's a good sentence right there. That's a real strong yeah. sentence it's as far, a song title. We can use that word we it saw doesn't. earlier today. Um, extortionate when talking about mm-hmm. different apps, and we're like extortionate. It's a real, it's a real word to use. Yeah. Like all the scam apps, and you're like, oh, this price is extortionate. Like, that's a damn fine adjective right there. <laughs> you ever just drop that in conversation in public? This fucking person is really smart. Yeah. They have a great vocabulary. They know what they're talking about. Sometimes you just throw out the word versimilitude. I, I don't know what it means. That's not a word. <laughs> it fucking is. I feel like you're lying. No, <laughs> what it's a real mean? word. I don't know. It's not important. Okay. I throw it out so that I sound smart. As long as they don't know what it means. True. See? Hold on. I will say, I only learned about the word extrapolate after watching the movie Chicago, and now I just work it in sometimes. <laughs> That's a good word. It is a good word. Extrapolate's a great word. Yeah. Dis- Thank you, disseminate? Here. Disseminate, yeah. yes. Disseminating information. information. Yeah, there you are. That's See? Our minds. But then people would know it. Like you have that like reference of like the second word, right? But if you're just like out here just going like, ah, yes, of course, the verisimilitude. Like you gotta hope that like you're not near somebody who knows shit. Otherwise, now all of a sudden you're in a competition with that person of who is the smartest, and you're gonna be found out that it's not you. That it's not you, Bessie. Yeah. That's why you make sure all of your friends are dumber than you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, because you can just really just trust them with mm-hmm words that you don't actually know the meaning i have a couple of friends who are like attorneys and like they work for judges and sometimes they'll like, use words and i'm looking at them like what the fuck did you just say to me <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's like it's like if you're in your community of, of like like-minded people or like uh, uh the passions are the same and you can speak in the same kind of like like if you're talking about music or you're talking about like uh law which I'm like, why would you do that outside of a law office, a law office, if you will? And law- it's like it's like just there are those words that are in context, like they make sense. But if you're just like out and about saying words, I feel like most people just aren't going to challenge you on them. 
But at the same time, like, why are you doing that? Like, if I'm talking about music, it's a power move. No, it's 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 a. If you go up to certain people, if I go up to certain people and I say, "Do you know the Gex?" They're gonna be like, "What?" <laughs> Yo, you, you down with Gex? Gex? You Gekin? <laughs> like Dude, how many Gex you got? <laughs> Got like 10,000 gigs, you know what I'm saying? I feel like this already doesn't make sense to the audience that is listening to this. They're like, they're talking about gigs. What the fuck is a gig? <laughs> what the fuck is a gig? Uh, <laughs> so outside of, yeah. <laughs> outside of different words, what are some words that you use while le- working on your other projects that you do kind of like self-producing. So I did see that you did some composition for poly G's and that you are kind of like collaborating with other, um, you know, industry folk in the Chicago area. So how does that kind of like get everything together and that works for you? Um, like how do I like get the music like ready for, well, how does it, um, how do you kind of just like operate within that, um, like new atmosphere? Uh, outside like differently from like being like an artist okay yeah um yeah it, it's interesting um like i try to still kind of like stay true to like who i am and what i would write or what i would think sounds cool um but also kind of like trying to understand like what a client is looking for um so i think it's kind of made me uh i think a better musician and songwriter uh, just kind of understanding like other people and um, what they're kind of looking for with that poly g's song that was kind of like a song idea that i had written for like a different company but didn't work out so i kind of already had this idea and then my friend <clears throat> made the promo video and he hit me up and he's like hey do you have any like any music that i can put with it and it just kind of like worked out perfectly for like the vibe that they were going like for that video. Um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of enjoy that process too. It's like the opposite of doing like a solo album where it's like communicating with somebody really directly about like their vision and like what they want. And I, I can kind of like put myself in their shoes a little bit more because like, I also do like my own stuff and I'm an artist, but like being a collaborator and a producer, <clears throat> I feel like I have a better, like, full picture of everything now. Hmm. It's like, as a musician, I've always felt so insular. Insular. It's another word. Words. I'm adding it as a word to the list of words to say. But it's like that that collaboration side. I'm always like, eh, I don't really want to, like, do this person's ideas, you know? And it's it's always been hard to, like, kind of get over that, like, that, that, hump of like no i'm just gonna try like doing whatever their idea is in that collaboration like do you do you feel like you've always kind of been like i want to collaborate with as many people as possible and just take in their ideas and and try new things like that i think uh it is it comes down to like working with people that you um communicate well with and that you trust like when uh we were doing co-writing for sleep on it it was like that was a weird thing to have somebody else take us, take something in a different direction than we would normally do. And it's like, is this right? Is this going to sound like us? Whatever. But you kind of have to, and that trust takes a little bit of time. And also working with somebody that you're like, you like their work that they've previously done. So I think trust is like the biggest component in that sense. Um, but I like, uh, getting involved in somebody else's creative process and sometimes it's just like not the right fit which is totally cool um, but, but sometimes it, it, it works out super well so it kind of it kind of forces you to like get out of your own head 100% as like a songwriter or a musician or artist or whatever um, and I think in turn has like just helped me grow as a musician and songwriter as like a, a producer now, how do you feel about like other producers going into writing with a band or with an artist and they come in? Like, do you look back at like producers you've worked with and you're like, oh, okay, like I see how 
like we may have gone into the studio with this idea and how the producer was feeling about it at that moment and like are you like seeing it from the other side now dude fuck yes so much oh my god um I wish I could go we worked with so many great producers and I wish I could go back and just be more like observant of what they were doing uh, just more aware um but yeah a hundred percent uh just thinking like more like what that what the process is after we leave the studio and like what goes into making something sound really great yeah has totally changed my perspective of um like being on the artist side of things um so yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah i have even more respect for the craft than i did before because especially as a producer so much of what you're doing is like there's a technical side of it but it's really like a you're working with a band or recording a band it's really like a psychological even if it's like working with somebody remotely just like Music is so personal and uh, vulnerable that you don't really trust in who you're working with. Um, you're just not going to get excited about it, and it's not going to be like a good performance, or it's not going to sound the way that it's supposed to. So, I kind of forget what the original question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like if you were if you were to go back into the studio with. Uh either for yourself or for a group or anything, if you were to go back in the studio and work with a producer, like how do you think you would approach it differently? Um, I think like just coming in with a more open mind because what happens for me and for a lot of artists is you get demo like Like <laughs> had this idea, this is how it should sound. And any change is like, you know, it's like blasphemy or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, that comes with that comes down to that trust is if you're working with somebody you trust and they're like, really think it would sound better this way, you know, being open to change and not holding on with a death grip to like an, an idea or like a part. Um, yeah. And just continue like asking for their, the producers like opinion, like, what do you think? Should I do it this way or that way? You know, um, yeah, I, I think I would, that's how it would be different. Nice. Um, we are almost at an hour. I want to make sure that you have time to, uh, to toss out some plugs. And we got some people over in chat who, uh, who we can talk to as well. Uh, so where can people listen to the record? And they have to. So they really? need to know this location. Yeah, it's the law. Uh, I don't make the rule, but mm -hmm. somebody does. Um, you can listen to the album on Spotify, iTunes, um, or Apple Music, I guess, YouTube, um, wherever. Yeah, it's streaming now everywhere. Um, yeah, the album's called Great Places. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and where can they find you on, like, Instagram? It's all under your name, not Oslo the City. <laughs> yeah it's under my name i like uh i had a moment of like do i make like a separate thing or a separate social media account but um uh i decided to j just keep it all personal because it's all kind of kind of what we were saying before what i'm trying to create um and uh also is a part of that so yeah it's uh my name tj haransky on instagram and twitter um and TikTok as well. So. Stitch the TikTok. Blow the song up yeah. on TikTok. Duet Do it. This. Duet, Duet something it. of it. Yeah. Stitch that shit. Stitch that shit. That's what they say now, right? The kids, the cool, yes. cool kids <laughs> that are always on my lawn. Get off my lawn, stupid Bus kids. Bust in. Yo, oh, cat. <laughs> Yo, cat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, guys. I'm, I feel like... Not me making Gen Z references. Yeah. Oh. Couldn't be me, bestie. See? <laughs> Lizzie calls me bestie constantly, and I am starting to think that it's passive aggressive. It's not. <laughs> it's so firmly wholesome. passive aggressive. Right? See? Thank you. That's really sweet. It's like... It's like telling somebody, like, yeah, no, I, we're friends, and, like, I care about you, but, like, in a way where you're, like... 
Yeah, so don't 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 fuck around like that. Stop fucking around, you fucking asshole. But I told I would just tell you if that was the I case. I don't know. I don't know because like you keep calling me bestie and I keep experiencing a if different If it makes you feel better, I was on a podcast panel on Saturday and all I and it was and I made a joke. I was like, "Take a drink every time I said bestie in this hour long <laughs> panel." I uh I teach at a uh, school of rock. Uh, I teach mm. guitar and bass and keys as well and uh uh, a lot of my students especially the high school students they every other word is slay so anytime they say slay (laughs) i make them put a uh quarter in the slay jar (laughs) oh my god figurative quarter jar but yeah yeah (laughs) it's like it's okay if you swear but i swear to god if you say slay one more time Mm -hmm. yeah that's it you're fucking out of here Slay is the worst four-letter word. Lesson's over. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Well, cool. We are going to continue talking with uh, the people who are hanging out over on Twitch. And uh, if you're listening to this and you missed the Twitch, that's on you. Because we got some some nice people over there. And you're not one of them. So you're not nice. And (laughs) uh, go and check out TJ on all the socials. Go check out Oslo on all of the musicals. And, uh, you know, maybe maybe you need a song. Maybe you need uh, some production help for your your maybe you maybe you have a business. You know, now you got somebody you can hit up and be like, hey, I need help. My business needs music behind it. And maybe TJ's your guy, you know, like I said on Twitter, maybe you're listening to Harry's house and you're feeling really good and you got to bring yourself back down to earth and just bum yourself out again. Go listen to Great Place. I got you. <laughs> <laughs>